Good afternoon. Today, we're going to explore some science. Fair warning, we're diving in deep, so this is going to be a long one. It's only human nature to find people and places in our world based on physical characteristics. Often using terms like short, I love you, though, white, hairy, or cute. But in an ever-progressive world that seeks change by shattering all definitions of the past, are these terms and adjectives even necessary? Some may try to convince you they're not. Well, yeah, they're merely social constructs. You're either a patriarchal society, specifically to disenfranchise and subjugate anyway. What a charity. Look, the human mind is like a computer. It's made simply to store, file, and sort information. It's through our mind and our senses that we perceive, interpret, and understand our world. In fact, we're actively judging all stimuli that we experience. People, places, and things. And this is precisely why each region of the brain is divided into two cortex. The primary and the associative. Most of this is a topic for a future set of videos on the anatomy of the brain. But today, we're going to explore science in a little different way. And in doing so, I'm probably going to give you the answer to the question you had when you first saw me. What kind of vision is that? Whoa, wait. You can't say that. The term is little person. It's 2022. Catch up! Okay, so the truth is, the M word has no scientific basis. Most of what you would probably perceive to be a midget would in fact be an individual with a proportionate type of dwarfism. The little people of America, or the LPA, define dwarfism as a medical or a genetic condition that results in an adult height of 4 feet 10 or shorter. That's just under 1.5 meters for you metric folks. But clearly, as you can tell, not all people with dwarfism are the same. In fact, there are over 400 known conditions and still some yet to be identified. But today, I'm going to focus on my type of dwarfism, diastropic dysplasia. Obviously, you don't see as many people like me around as you see a more common type like achondroplasia. There's probably a few people with diastropic dysplasia that you've heard of. For example, my buddy Matt Roloff from Little People Big World. And also, if you're watching the new season of 90 Day Fiance, Alita also has diastropic dysplasia. So I'm sure by now you're wondering, why don't we see as many people with diastropic dysplasia? And why is achondroplasia more common? Well, to understand that, you really got to understand genetics. And I'll be answering that and more in today's episode of Diastropic for Dimwits. What do you say we dive right in? Uh oh! Uh -oh. It's okay, folks. I got good doctors. Okay, let's get started. Diastrophic dysplasia, also referred to as DTD. However, we typically in the little people community, at least in the U.S., refer to it as DD. On average, this type of dwarfism occurs one in every 110,000 births. So you're probably wondering, why is this condition less common? Well, first off, achondroplasia is an autosomal dominant condition. Whereas diastrophic dysplasia is an autosomal recessive condition. So what's the difference? Well, dominant conditions or traits results when only one copy of that gene is received from either parent. However, a recessive trait results only when the same copy of that gene is received from both parents. So the next question is, what gene causes diastrophic dysplasia? That is the slc 26 a 2 now, before we get into the specifics about this gene, we first need to take a look at how genes are constructed. Let's take a look at the DNA molecule, also known as the double helix. This spiral-shaped chain-like molecule has a sugar phosphate backbone made up of deoxyribose, a sugar molecule, and the phosphate group. The internal core of the double helix is a nitrogenous base. It is made up of four types of nucleotides. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. One turn of the DNA molecule consists of 10 pairs of these nucleotides. The specific order and arrangements of these nucleotides strung together in a sequence creates what we know to be specific genes. These genes serve for the coding of something, typically proteins. Most human genes consist of anywhere between 300 and 1 million of these nucleotide pairs. Measuring at 3.4 nanometers per turn and 2 nanometers in diameter, this may seem small, but trust me, it adds up. In fact, 
If we were to remove the DNA from the nucleus of a single cell, it would stretch out to a length of around 6 feet, or 2 meters. So in other words, there's a lot of information packed in a very small space. Kind of like the gap between my ears. Now in order to keep this coil wound in a clean and organized fashion during reproduction, specialized stabilizing proteins called histones are employed. The combination of these histone proteins and the DNA chained together is referred to as a nucleosome fiber. This fiber coils to become the loop domains which create specific bands within our chromosomes. The genome, or the entire collection of genes that create who you are, is written across 23 pairs of these chromosomes. That is a total of 46 chromosomes, 23 of which came from your father, and 23 from your mother. And the gene that we have identified to be responsible for DD, SLC26A2, is located here, in the 32nd Q cytoband of the 5th chromosome. If you were to look at two individual chromosomes in a pair up close, you would see that they mostly carry the same genes in the same locations. However, when examining closer, you can observe slight variations known as mutations within the code. Some mutations happen for the first time within your own genome. However, most of these happen much earlier in your gene pool and have been passed down from generation to generation. This is the case for my diastrophic dysplasia. Both of my parents happen to carry the same mutation to the same gene. So to recap, it is because each of my parents only had one copy of this mutated gene that the dominant normal copy overrode the recessive mutated copy and therefore they don't display any symptoms. They were instead only carriers. Out of my three siblings, I pulled the lucky straw and received both of my parents' mutated copy of the gene and thus, here I am. Pick a winner! All three feet on me. So now we know how our DNA changed to form genes and how our genes are regions within cytobands that make up our chromosomes. We have identified the diastrophic gene to be a mutation to the SLC26A2 gene located on the 32nd Q cytoband of the 5th chromosome. So what is the role of this gene and why does the mutation lead to diastrophic dysplasia? This gene provides instructions for making proteins necessary for the normal development of cartilage and the conversion of cartilage to bone. So therefore, it goes without saying that most of our issues are orthopedic related. DD results in extreme short stature, 3 to 4 feet on average, short arms and legs, osteoarthritis, joint contractors, which is a permanent shortening of muscles and joints, Diastrophic dwarfism is often characterized by several deformities, scoliosis and kyphosis, the abnormal curvature of the spine, hitchhiker thumb, shortening of the first metacarpal, fused knuckles, cleft palate, cauliflower ear, club feet, hip and knee dysplasia, and hernias. So now we covered the genetics prevalence and the characteristics of DD. The next most commonly asked question is, What's the prognosis? Well, the most serious challenges occur early in childhood and adolescence. Orthopedic issues range in severity, from problems that cause mobility issues like club feet, to life-threatening issues as when the spinal curvature impedes on vital organs like the lungs. But typically speaking, when a child makes it through these early challenges, they can go on to live a full and healthy life. Yay! So to conquer these early challenges, obviously we'll need medical treatment and a proper diagnosis. Yep. For the most optimal treatment, you'll need an accurate diagnosis. Considering the rarity of this disorder, that doesn't always come immediately at birth. Some doctors are more informed than others on various types of dwarfism. And many doctors have little to no experience with dwarfism or DD. However, with simple genetic testing, this gene can be easily identified. Wow. Having a proper diagnosis helps the doctors review other case studies to determine the best course of treatments. And most of these treatments are going to be orthopedic related. The reconstruction of the feet, the knees, and the hips to improve mobility. And most importantly, stabilizing the spine to prevent impediment on the respiratory system. I believe that it pays to have a doctor that has a lot of experience playing with a potato-shaped head as a kid. <laughs> well, 
you don't see that every day. Come on. <laughs> so let's talk about the daily life of the DD. Besides relying on a couple tools to reach and to get around, most of us go on to live normal lives. We can cook. We can drive with the use of pedal extensions or hand controls. We can live on our own, or get married, or have kids. Just remember, DD is a recessive condition, so the only way the child would be DD, if both parents are. Congratulations, you have now completed this lesson. So I hope you learned something in today's video, including the fact that Humpty Dumpty didn't fall off a wall, he fell into it. The truth is, as a kid, I felt a lot like Humpty Dumpty, the way my doctors put me back together again. It was kind of like my superpower. And he was kind of my role model. But I did get tired of that same old question. What happened to you? As a kid, I'd often have some kind of crazy response. Like, uh, I fell out my dad's airplane at 12,000 feet. Or I got thrown through a brick wall. I know it's a bit extreme, but I got tired of being asked as if they expected some extreme story about how I got this condition. So at times, I gave it to him. As an adult, I still channel my inner Humpty Dumpty. But when life gives me walls, I just cut a B-sized hole in it. But all jokes aside. Every individual with diastrophic dysplasia has their own unique case with varying symptoms and severity. The order and the timing of these procedures will depend on the individual case and what their doctors deem to be the most pressing issues. So I can't speak for everybody with DD, but I can tell you about my experience. And generally speaking, most people with DD have a similar path. As soon as I was born, it was obvious there was problems. At five pounds, 10 ounces, my birth weight really wasn't that low. But both of my feet were so severely clubbed that they were backwards, and my heels hadn't yet developed. My arms and legs were extremely short. I had a hitchhiker thumb on both hands. I had a cleft palate, and my ears also had extreme swelling. So at six weeks old, I had my first procedure, and that was to drain the fluid off of my ears to reduce the swelling. And that was just the beginning. I went on to have about 20 to 25 operations by the time I was around 12 years of age. I had a club feet repair done on both feet three times. And I had a series of skin grafts to build my heels up. During one of these surgeries is when they experimented to correct my hip tracker thumb. I'm right handed so I asked them to do my left hand first just in case it didn't work. And while the repair looks better, it did slightly decrease my range of motion so I didn't do the other hand. The cleft palate repair, obviously another surgery that I needed early on. As a result, I can still remember the first day that I was able to blow out a candle, around the age of five years old. And of course, as I discussed in the book, obviously the most life-threatening aspect of ED is the spinal curvature. My spine is shaped like a spiral staircase. It's twisted like a DNA molecule. In fact, the term diastrophism derives from a Greek word meaning twisted and apart. So don't blame me, it's in my roots. I also had several major spine surgeries in an attempt to stabilize my spine. The last one being a success. My ribs were about twice as large as they should have been, and my scoliosis and kyphosis curved so quickly that I started having asthma every few hours. We felt like something might be wrong, so we took a trip to Strider's Hospital in Greenville. That's where they discovered that my ribs had punctured both lungs, so essentially I was breathing on about a third of a lung. So aside from a double lung repair, they had to do something to stabilize my spine. This was a make it or break it procedure. If they could stabilize my spine, I could go on and live a happy life. But if not, the curvature would continue to impede on my respiratory tract until the point that I could no longer breathe. The issue was I was only about 12, so I hadn't gone through puberty yet. And they knew I still had some growing to do. A little bit, but still some growing to do. So therefore, they would have put metal rods in, then I had to go back later and put in bigger ones. But every time they opened me up, my breathing problems got worse, so that wasn't really a good option. They had to do something to stabilize my spine that wouldn't require them to open me up again. And that's when Shriners pulled off a miracle. They assembled a dream team, doctors from three different countries, and before it about a 10 or 12 hour procedure, known today to be a strut graft. This is a very common procedure done today using cadaver bones, but I was one of the first, so I didn't have a cadaver bone. They started by cutting all my ribs in half to get rid of the excess. They took out the bottom two and moved the third one up towards my spine. Then they took an inch out of my left tibula bone attached it to the rib bone, and attached it to the spinal column. That way, it could act as a live rod, and it would continue to grow as I grew. Obviously, it was successful. That's the only reason I'm here today to tell you about it. And this is the primary concern for children with DD in the early years. First step is to stabilize the spine. Everything else comes after. 
after stabilizing the spine, the next focus is typically the feet, the knees, and the hips. I personally haven't had any procedures done in my knees or my hips yet. And this is partly due to the struggle I had to get my feet reconstructed in order to walk. And that's because the older method of a club foot repair fell to my right foot. It turned in so much that I was unable to stand on the bottom of it. It was not until I was 21 that I found a doctor willing to experiment and reconstruct my leg. The problem is that my ankle was still completely straight. It was just the foot below the ankle had sagged so much out of place. So no ankle repair was really going to fix the problem. So he decided to cut through my tib and my fib and my lower leg, rotate the foot around in the correct angle, and reattach the leg bones. So now if you look at my ankle on an x-ray, my ankle is laying completely on its side, 90 degrees, but my foot is flat. This was just another experiment that happened to work out perfectly. So being that I didn't really start walking until I was 21, I hadn't really had time to wear about like most DDs that started walking at an earlier age. Okay, the truth is, they're shot. They're wore out. But frankly, I'm not ready to do anything about it yet. I'm not sure that I ever will be. So aside from all the major orthopedic surgeries, I also had multiple surgeries on my ears, like tubes, eardrum hole repairs. I had a bilateral hernia repair as well, pharyngeal flap that came along with a cleft palate. At this point in my life, I've had between 36, 40 surgeries. Who's count? Currently have one about every other year on a rare condition I have in my eye which I'll discuss in another video. So I hope you enjoyed my presentation on diastrophic dysplasia. I looked on YouTube and I was disappointed. Like, there's no videos explaining this condition. So now there is. And of course, like everything, it's not that simple. I can spend days and days going down the rabbit hole and talk about DD and genetics, all the science related. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section. And if you like this video, hit the thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, exploring the science of things, let me know. I know most people know me as a builder, but the truth is, I've been a scientist for a lot longer than I've been in construction. Well, that's it. Like and subscribe and share this video. Y'all have a good one. <laughs> that's right, Karen. Stay out. We don't need your time here. Quick disclaimer, no caring were hurt in the making of this video. And if you want to know more about the author of Diastrophic for Dimwits, I guess you need to look at his YouTube channel.